Uh, welcome to the Helix webinar series. Today's session is on BMC Helix Service Management 23.3. Our presenter today is Emma Gore from Solutions Marketing. Before she formally introduces herself, let me just remind you how uh, this operates. So you have the Q&A section in Zoom. Please post your questions during this session. And at the end, we will have time for live Q&A where we will open up the line for you to talk with us. But please use this as an interactive session and use the Q&A section. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand over to Emma for her introduction. Thank you ever so much, Sam. Um, I am Emma Gore. I'm in solutions marketing for BMC Helix. Today, I'm going to talk to you about um, Helix Service Management 23.3.0 and specifically what we are doing around enterprise service management. So I'll just move you to the um, agenda slide. So basically, thank you for your time today. Um, so in this session, I'm going to be discussing the flagship features within BMC Helix Service Management 23.3.0 and these re these were released on the 7th of December and they relate to enterprise service management. I'll be providing an update on HR service management and we'll be discussing how we're deploying Helix GPT to enable employees have more human-like conversations with virtual agents and finally we'll be covering security instant handling. If you have any questions about upgrading to this version and licensing, please contact your account manager and your customer success team. So let's move to the next slide. So let's start with some level setting about what is enterprise service management or why enterprise service management. So in essence, this is an organizational approach to improve the delivery, the quality and the efficiency of services across your enterprise. And I guess this is what IT have been doing for a number of years, and it's been able to extend those principles to the rest of the enterprise, which is broadly speaking is the ability to connect data, workflows and analytics for those better business outcomes. So let's look explore why this is interesting at the moment for organizations. So organizations today are dealing with very siloed service delivery teams who are going to have who are going to have different ways to um, deliver those services to employees and also the way that your employee will request those services may be different. This is going to lead to or is leading to a lot of application clutter as there are many, many different fragmented applications across organizations and low value and, and essentially um, those, or, those organizations or those functions, the people working with them in them are focused on what we would consider with low value manual processes, uh, managing emails and calls, et cetera, with no clear SLAs and timescales. And ultimately that's going to lead to lower um, scores within kind of employee experience and customer satisfaction and service delays. So if we move to the next slide. Um, so this is where we want to talk to you about what BMC Helix is doing within the, within the um, realms of enterprise service management. So firstly, we've, we have a low code, no code platform which actually takes away a lot of the cost and complexity of coding these different applications and services. But to get you started, we've actually created a suite of line of business solutions, which have been pre-built to fulfill those common service requests that those teams are handling, such as onboarding new employees. And this means that actually you can streamline the time it takes for these different teams across your organization to get up and running on Helix. And the platform enables different functions to work within their own line of business. So they only see the templates and tasks and roles that are relevant to their function. Also, automation is built into the platform so that certain service requests can be automatically fulfilled in the, in the, in the um, as, we, as we call zero touch, such as the request um, for a letter of employment verification. And this is without any um, human 
intervention. Or also we offer iPass, which gives you the ability to extend those work workflows into third party tools, such as what we're doing with CrowdStrike for security instant handling. And the other area is about driving collaboration. So this is where service fulfillment can span a number of different functions. Again, onboarding being a classic example of that. And within the platform, you're the, you have the ability to assign tasks, different lines of business, work on cases together and share messages between the different teams. And ultimately, it's about elevating experiences. So, you know, we know our employees are used to consumer like experiences and they want that in their workplace. And through uh, technologies like digital workplace, they have the ability to use the channel, a channel of their choice uh, to access services from different functions, access knowledge articles for self-service and receive updates in the way that they want. And obviously, most recently, using Helix G GPT, they can have human like conversations with virtual agents to drive self-service and trigger those service requests. So let's move into the next slide. So let me just check. Yeah, so basically this is um, a summary of where we are today in terms of the line of business solutions that are available on the platform. Um, and also, we also give you an example of the different ways that our customers are also building out their workflows into the business. So let's look at, let's move to the next slide and look at HR. So within HR service management, we're offering a no touch, low touch or no touch workflow services to empower the employer around common HR requests and for HR teams to do a better job in terms of managing their service levels. And if we want to talk specifically about one of the most complex areas um, of HR, that would be specifically around employee onboarding and offboarding. So if we move to the next slide, let's have a look at what we've built that's available to you now out of the box. So this illustrates the end to end out of the box onboarding workflow that we've developed within BMC Helix. And it works from the start of the onboarding process, pre-boarding day one and day in the life. And the goal here is to show that the onboarding process is built around the new hire and works for multiple departments. So basically when the onboarding process is triggered via your HCM system, the new hire will receive their notification to sign up to a pre-hire portal and they can complete their to-dos and submit documentation. Remember the key point here is that they're still external to the organization. So we'll be they'll be using their Gmail address to register and receive their pre-boarding to-dos. Then secondly, during the pre-boarding phase, all the pre-boarding tasks, all the onboarding tasks can be orchestrated via BMC Helix. So you can now standardize the onboarding process with pre-populated onboarding case templates to ensure internal functions are working together to support that new hire. And these tasks include checklists, so it makes to make it really simple to tick off individual steps within those tasks. Also, the solution gives the hiring manager the ability, real visibility into the process, and also HR operations teams, a single pane of glass from which to view all the onboarding tasks and their status and understand where there could be delays, where there's issues so they can drill into them and make sure that the process works as effectively as it should. And then finally, on day one, the new hire automatically becomes an employee. They log into the employee portal and all their documents and activities during that pre-boarding phase are now under their employee name and they can receive their day one tasks, training and orientation. And within this release, that was enhanced with on offboarding. So we've now included an offboarding workflow and alumni portal to ensure that there is a safe and secure onboarding process. So we're managing the entire employee life cycle. Sorry, I meant to say next slide. Okay. <laughs> yes. Okay. So um, I'm now going to dive into one of the most exciting areas um, that we, we've been investing in over the last 
few few months really with regards to Helix GPT. Um, and at this point, I'm going to hand over to Kath, who is the uh, product manager for our uh, Helix GPT portfolio within DWP. And we're going to try and make this part of the presentation as interactive as possible. So I'm I now am, playing the I role do. higher. <laughs> so I'm now playing the role of uh, me, who actually the other day, um, I'm struggling to get email to work on my work phone. So I'm going to work through this scenario with CAF showing how I would interact with GPT to get the answers that I need. Okay. So um, can you see my screen now? Not or Yes, it's clear. Kathy, can you see the Helix also. GPT screen? Okay. Yep. yep. Great. So Emma, you said you can't really use your uh, iPhone to read emails. Is that correct? No, it's a struggle. I don't know and I can't be bothered to go through phone calls and log issues i just want to get it sorted and get on with my job <laughs> but i guess you know that there is um, on our our um, internet there are documentation describing how to do that right yeah but you know i'm too busy with my day-to-day -day job and i don't want to be trawling through articles to try and find out what the answers are and and you also know that you can reach out to the service desk right Yes, 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 I do. <laughs> but surely there's why, a quicker way with GPT. Do <laughs> why don't you do it? Um, because it means I'm logging into something else, it's disrupting my day, and I just want to quickly and okay. easily use something like GPT to be able okay. to get my answers quickly. So, let's try then. We have uh, Helix GPT in this environment, and we'll, we'll ask it a, a few questions here so to see what happens. Uh, so you say, how how do I re uh, reset the password of email on my iPhone? Very human. That's what you ask, isn't it? Yeah. I should be correct. Reset. I am very good at misspelling things. Maybe it can handle that, but I, I'll try this one and see what we get as an answer you could of course search as you said for knowledge articles or documents on um, our internet or you could open a ticket in the service desk but the whole idea of uh, what we have built in helix gpt is that you can ask a question and it will actually do that for you it will search the knowledge basis and it will find answers to it and you see here it's pretty mm -hmm. easy Go to settings, <laughs> passwords and accounts, select the email account, remove the old password, and enter the new password. Click Okay, done. great. <laughs> it's pretty quick, isn't it? Well, I like the way that it's also given to me in a succinct way. I don't have yeah. to be, you know, reading lots of information to try and find out what I need. So it's good. We can maybe even make it a little bit more easy to read, maybe by saying uh, something like, Please answer answer in numbered bullets. Would that be great? Yeah. I think it's probably easier to read them like this. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay, great. So do you, you asked me about holidays yesterday. Why was that? Well, I was talking to um, a work colleague of mine in Sweden, and they seem to have a different holiday policy than we do in the UK. So I was curious as to what their policy was. And, and you know, and they, it sounds to me like they have to take all their holidays in June and July. Um, so I was just curious. I wanted to find out what the holiday policy looked like for Sweden. So I might yeah. want to move there. Yeah, okay. Uh, do we have a holiday policy? Is that the question, right? Yeah. Okay. 
okay. Yes, there is Oh, wow. education policy. And it's talking about things here. Uh, is it clear how many? Uh, Sweden, 30 days it's saying here. So Ah, that but only is what 15 we get here. in, in the US. And there is a little bit different in the US. But um, did you hear that um, Kelly that works in Canada actually wanted four weeks in the summer? Oh, right. So what's the policy like in Canada? Yeah, I don't know. It doesn't say here, does it? No. So let's ask here how many days... of annual vacation. Is that what they call it in the US? What do you call it in UK? We uh, we call it holiday, but Okay, so it's it's I'll use the Canadian word to see how that how that works. How many days of annual vacation do Canadians get? Is that a good question? Yeah. Canadians like that. Okay. So we have it there. And And it's instant. it It's instant. It's great. I mean, it and it's given to me in language that I can understand and yeah, it's I get good. my answers quickly. It's it's a consumer like experience. So I'm pleased. It looks good. And the good thing is, I mean, if you have used it, it's very much like Chat GPT that everybody has tested by now, I think. Um But the good thing is that we're not using the knowledge of uh, the the large language model, which is actually trained on internet sites. We Mm. actually use our internal knowledge articles that are stored in in the knowledge base. So we know that it can be maintained. We know it's correct. And uh, uh, the, the knowledge base itself is managing the quality of the answers. And if you don't really trust, if you wonder, is this really correct? You you see here, we have links to uh, the different policies here. So I can check there if there is a Canadian one. I don't see if it's, do you see if, if there is a Canadian one? Yeah, it is it, under the British Columbia. Yeah, that's the one. It, is it? Okay. Yeah. Uh, it's um, British, British. Colombia in Canada. Is that what we ask? I don't know. Is that correct? We'll we'll ask it and see if it knows. I don't know. Yes, it is. Okay. And I also wonder is uh, Vancouver where Kelly lives uh, in Canada, in British Columbia, because I need to know. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know if, if I'm correct, right? So so it, it allow you to continue and ask questions like this. And I don't know, do they speak French in Vancouver? In, there is French, Canadian, Canadian French, right? So we could even ask it to translate to French if we want to do that. So this is what we have right now in um, the current version of Digital Workplace. You can ask questions and you can chat with your knowledge base instead of classic search where you would get a long list of knowledge articles instead. You can flip over to search and search for things if you like, uh, but um, this is more convenient and it feels pretty old fashioned to get the long list like you get, get in Google with um, a lot of links in there, right? And Oh, what if um, somebody put in a question that wasn't related to a knowledge article? What kind of response would you get? So if you were asking something generic. About it. Let's, right. let's ask about uh, vacation policy in UK. Uh, how many days of holiday do... Uh, British people get what, or what do you, what do you call yourself? British, yeah. (laughs) 
You see? Okay. Yeah. We don't have the knowledge article for UK, so therefore it can't answer. So there's no hallucinations or... No, if there, I mean, if you suspect there is a, a hallucination, that's when you can click on these links and you can validate what, what is mm. really, what is really the source of the information and where did we get it from? You see here, here is this mm. stuff about uh, twelve months and three weeks when you have been there five years. So it is there. It's true. You you actually have it there. So right. Well, thank you ever so much. I think that was a nice, um, quick and easy demonstration of this capability. There's just one last piece before we can um, open this out to Q&A, which is around what we're doing within security incident handling. Yeah, um, let me switch back to your you... slides then, I okay. guess. Okay, that yes. would be great. Thank you. Here. Do you see them now? Yeah, if if you just move past that slide to yeah. So here is Helix GPT. Yeah, and, and then on to the next slide. So the good. So I mean, if if somebody wants to test this out in your Helix environment, you will need to upgrade to twenty three three, and you will need to have a, a subscription with. Sure or open AI, because we are not really delivering the large language models that is uh, Microsoft or open AI right now. We are also working with Google and uh, Amazon to make sure you can use those models they have hosted. Right, thank you, Kat. Um, so let's just also move on to um, security instant handling, which was the latest out of the box solution that um, has is being shipped with twenty three point three point zero. Um, so let me just summarise to you what 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 this solution is. There is also um, our product manager Kapil is on this call. So if there's more more specific questions that you have around this capability, he is here. And available to to answer those questions. So, in a nutshell, um, security instant handling aligns really tightly with the secu uh, security instant handling processes that are outlined in industry and government standards, and specifically NIST eight hundred sixty one and ISO two seven zero zero one. Um, so you really have a methodical process for each phase of an incident management life cycle, including the identification, investigation, response and remediation. Um, within the solution, we offer pre-configured run books, which are which provide uh, which address the most common security scenarios and help standardize those activities for each phase and provide collaboration and integrations to ensure that all essential areas and teams are involved in the activities. And really we see this solution as the missing piece in many organizations' security operations posture. And this solution really brings together the prevent and respond processes um, and associated teams and provides that regulatory audit and evidence constructs, which are incredibly important within um, security incidents. So if we move to the to the next slide here, we just want to sort of summarize here what um, the, uh, the, the the impact that this is this the reason that we've built this, we've built this in collaboration with our uh, design partners who were effectively saying that there wasn't really um, there was no or to low support tool for this for, for security and handling, often uh, many customers are sitting on um, an ITSM tool that has the category of security, but really they're not following um, standardized auditable processes. Also, they were struggling with the ability to collaborate across all the different teams that were needed uh, in terms of being able to create a security response, effective security response. So, um, and of course that creates risks risks in terms of prolonged exposure, uh, the ability to not have those lessons learned and look at kind of, you know, next steps to prevent those, those incidents happening again. 
and the time and labour involved in documenting these activities. So if we move to the next slide, you know, ultimately what, what customers have been looking for here is the ability to drive better coordination across the teams, have standardised processes, the ability to build that post-mortem and lessons learned process more effectively. Um, and again, reducing the impact. That's what we're all, everybody's intention is to do and making sure that you've got streamlined and repeatable processes and documented activities for um, regulatory reporting. So if I just quickly just go through uh, here, sorry, if you just move to the next slide. Yeah, so there are within the solution, um, we always ship our solutions with a pre configured portal. So um, if you think about where, how, and uh, where your, your employees would go to log incidents, um, this is the easiest way for them to be able to do that. You know, obviously, in future, as we kind of move ahead with GPT, there'll be greater ability to engage. Uh, using virtual agents, etc., around security incidents. And if you move to the next slide, this will kind of show you what you have uh, with regards to the out-of-the-box run books that we currently have available. So at the moment, the solution is shipped with 11 different run books, um, and they provide um, default task flows and auto-categorization, um, to cover everything from a denial of service attack to malicious software, phishing, unauthorized access, um, lost equipment and fraud. And if we just move to the next slide here, this is an illustration of how you can view these incidents by um, stage name. You can view by task classification. Um, you can filter. Um, by task activity, and you can also um, report on tasks performed on different security stages. And then finally, if we move to the next slide here, um, is uh, the important aspect here is also being able to integrate with um, IT service management, um, which is providing support for creating incidents and work orders using templates, the ability to search and relate to existing ITSM tickets, including incident change problem and work order to a security case. Uh, view detail, details of the ITSM tickets, including the status and add work notes uh, in one or more of the ITSM tickets with uh, support for adding attachments. And then finally, if we just move to the to the final slide here, it's the also the ability to create a chain of custody. So the ability to collect digital files associated with the security incident, define metadata um, for evidence of who collect of of who um, evidence in terms of how it was collected, the time of collection, the source of the file and maintain that chain of custody of each piece of evidence and file that separately, um, and also download that evidence log as a PDF. And then just to find, finish on, on, on our ability to uh, integrate, so obviously, you know, one of the power, one of the most powerful aspects of the the platform is to be able to extend your workflows um, with third party applications, and this is a great example of how we're integrate, integrating via iPass with CrowdStrike um, and the ability to map fields between CrowdStrike and the business workflows case, so that you can um, be more effective in that bi directional integration. And that concludes the presentation section of um, this webinar. I think I'm going to hand back to Sam to uh, find out if we've got any questions and open this up for Q&A. Thank you ever so much. We, we do have a lot of questions, actually. It's been quite interactive in there. Um, I'm just unmuting people as we speak. So if we take the first question that came, um, Ahmed, um, if you're still on, let me just see if I can unmute you. 
Um, so Amid's asked a question. He said, we note that the documentation of Helix needs more and more simplification of or, or the process of installation should be simplified further in case we need to move to Helix options. Automation, automation. So it's more commentary. I don't know um, if, uh, Kath, you want to mention anything, but um, there is that need for automation. So it's more more of a note to us. I don't know if you can see that in the chat. I think Ahmed's dropped now. Um, I I don't fully understand the question. Is that because there are the the installation of Helix is uh, taking a lot of steps? I think that is what he's talking about. Yes. Uh, Ahmed, are you, are you around? No, you're not, maybe. But, no, I mean, yes, it, it is um, uh, an effort to get things set up in your own data center. And I think the reason why many customers nowadays go to SaaS is because of, of the complexity of managing today's uh, complex products or advanced products i would say it, it's many things you need to know to be able to run and i think when we talk about the, the large language models and the new type of infrastructure you need for that it's even uh, more work and and uh, knowledge you need so yes i think a lot of work needed and a lot of knowledge needed and uh, the better we can help you do it, the, the better, of course. One thing we are working on is um, actually adding Helix GPT to our documentation site uh, so that you can ask questions like I demoed before on our mm -hmm. documentation. That will hopefully make it easier. Automation will also be part of uh, what we're doing in Helix GPT. I didn't demo that today, but you can actually automate things as well, uh, such as if Emma wanted to change the password, we could have done that automatically, potentially. Thank yeah, you, Carl, uh, to just add on there, if, uh, when it comes to the installation, um, yeah, we have the Jenkins pipelines and everything, right, as part of the containerized deployment right now, which makes the deployment of containerization images simple, right? So. Um, I mean, our ultimate aim at some point as um, we progress with the containerization to have like a zero time downtime for our customers whenever they are upgrading from one version to other. Um, so that's where the automation would also play in um, with like in all those automated CICD process and deployments of our images as they upgrade. So yeah. definitely we are working on that. Thank you, Kishore. Okay, let's move to the next question. So Uzma has asked a question. For the presented scenario, what modules are required to be enabled in the Helix on-prem deployment, DWP, AI ops, and what else, i.e. virtual agent? I don't know, Uzma, if you're still on. Yes, Uzma, if you'd like to talk, if you can hear us okay. I don't know, Kaf, um, whether you want to answer that or if there's someone in our panelists that can. I can see you're about to answer it. I see. Um, I mean, I, it, we have actually been talking about two major things here. The uh, enterprise service management capabilities, which uh, Emma has been talking about in general. And uh, it's based to a great extent on the Helix platform. And on the Helix platform, we run digital workplace for the end user interaction and for the uh, business analyst or HR team or, or uh, whoever is in the back end you use business workflows, which is automating a lot of these processes. And then in the security incident part, we were talking about uh, an integration to ITSM. That integration, of course, if you don't have ITSM, you can't do it because it's integrated with ITSM. Uh, 
none of what we have been talking about today actually requires the AI ops side because that is more monitoring infrastructure and uh, making sure that uh, the the people that manages the IT infrastructure has got tools. We didn't really talk about that today. Uh, I spoke about Helix uh, GPT and that requires uh, that you have a subscription to a large language model available like OpenAI 3.5 or OpenAI 4 API keys. So otherwise you need to upgrade to Helix 23.3. Any follow-up questions on that? Usma, can you hear us? Okay. I don't know if he's got audio. He is off mute. And answered. Okay. So the next question was, is Helix GPT IL-5 certified? To be honest, I don't know that. I need to take that question back and see. Okay. I'll just put to follow up. Okay. Um, next question we've got, and I can see we've got a few hands raised. We'll come to the hand raises shortly. Um, so Kara has asked a question, is this AI enterprise only? And how do you enrich data? Do you select sources where it is allowed to do look up? I don't know, Kara, if you want to come off mute. I think you're still on the line. You, you need to learn learn uh, Norwegian or Danish, whatever. It's Kora, <laughs> I oh. guess. Hi, Kora. Do you want to speak? I don't know. Oh, yeah, he's st still there. Let me just. Can you hear us? I need to learn to pronounce things in Swedish. Definitely, Kaf. <laughs> can you hear us? Yeah, yeah. I can hear you. Hello. Yeah, hello. I was just wondering, this is just an enterprise only AI, right? So, and we are kind of a quite large company in Norway, and um, we have different sources. And of course, we don't, we do not want everything to be able to kind of do look upon. So, do you define this where it can do look up? Yes. So, in twenty three three zero, we have support for the three knowledge bases that is in the Helix platform. You know, there is one in business workflows, there is one in ITSM, and we also have Helix knowledge management by Cameron. Knowledge articles in those three knowledge bases that are public are the ones that are referenced when you, uh, when you ask questions here. Uh, in Patch one, I hope we are already. You can also tag knowledge articles in in come around with tags, and then we have static and dynamic filters in DWP. I don't know if you have looked at that capability came out pretty recently, and uh, that means if you, for example, are want to create a page in DWP, which is HR focused, uh, you can filter on, so you only get answers, so that you only reference knowledge articles, which are HR, tagged with HR on it. And you can then also tag them with a location, which means if you are in India, you will get a different vacation policy answer than if you are in Sweden or Norway or Denmark or wherever you are. So yes, you can control that pretty detailed right now. Yeah, but uh, like uh, we have, uh, we, are, we are using uh, Atlas and uh, Confluence knowledge. Is it, uh, do you need to uh, import uh, this knowledge into the uh, Helix knowledge database? Yeah, what, what we do is uh, we, we in test the the knowledge into a vector database and then when you ask a question we use uh, the embedding model is called an embedding model that is uh, also doing a similarity search we compare the meaning of the knowledge article and the question and if they are close we use that piece of knowledge and we send that together with uh, instruction prompts or prompt templates, as it's called, over to a large language model 
which can be hosted by Microsoft, for example, because as you know, it's you probably have, if you are already using large language models, generative AI in something, you have an enterprise model that is only yours that nobody else can use. So that is what we aim at mostly. Thank you. Is that answering your question? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank great, you. thanks. Okay, next question from Bob. Um, Bob, if you want to come off mute as well. Um, he said, I thought you were providing a closed loop GPT solution. If not, then the government can't use this. Hello, Bob. Hey, how are you doing, Samantha? Good, thank you. So, yeah, the, the way we had been told from as it was being built and, you know, as you went into uh, Helix, uh, headed for Helix on-prem as well as the SaaS solution, is that the AI was a closed loop AI. And, you know, as you may or may not be aware, the U.S. government, is not embracing using regular chat GPT uh, out there. So, mm -hmm. you know, is, if you're in SAS and FedRAMP SAS scenario, you're talking about having to, uh, to uh, work out with Microsoft or whoever out there to uh, integrate with this. How's yeah. that going to work? Okay. Yeah, let, let me try to give you a, a kind of explanation of this. We are in a pretty early stage of, uh, of uh, the GPT world, as you know. We are one of the first companies doing this uh, in, in production, so to say. But uh, what we have seen is, okay, you use ChatGPT and it's kind of wide open. We at BMC are not supposed to use it for coding, for example, because we don't know where it goes. And uh, the same with you in the government, I guess. When you talk to the vendors, OpenAI and Microsoft, they offer different versions of uh, the large language models. And if you go for the API, you actually go for an enterprise version of the large language model, as they call it. That one is very special for you. So, and nobody else can access it. They don't use it to train other models and, and so on. That is one option that I think most private large organizations go for today because they want to use generative AI and they use that model. So that is where we are right now at BMC. We have support for that. We are also looking at what if um, we can host the models in uh, somewhere else and somewhere else is a little bit unclear right now we're talking to many customers and it would be interesting to to hear what you in the u.s government plan to do on this because you need that special infrastructure that is called gpus and it's quite advanced technology and uh, you can, of course, buy that service from Google or from Amazon or anywhere. But I don't know if that's where you're going. It, it, I, I don't. We don't really have um, have the answer yet. How we're going to do it exactly? I don't think we're going to set up a, a data center within BMC where we are running these things. So we need to work together with people like you to find out exactly how that's going to work. Right. I, I don't I guess know if my you have any point... feedback to it right now or, or if we can take the discussion later on. Yeah, I think, I think my main point is that I think you're going to have to get the whole model to be working in a fed ramp scenario mm. in order for the government to be able to use it. Yeah, I think so. And if that is in our data center or in a fed ramp certified data center that amazon is running over this i don't know yet and that i think we need to have a discussion about but definitely have dialogue with your account team and they will let us in in our development organization know what is the best option for you together with us it, it's a cost it's a cost aspect to this as well of course how much oh yes can, of course and we pay for it yeah the, those GPUs are really expensive and they are hard to get to because 
the big hyperscalers buy all of them. So it's it's not that easy to get there, but we are working on it. Let's collaborate on that. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Kaf. Uh, next question, is Helix GPT and Helix Chatbot different applications or the same? <laughs> Helix GPT is our generative AI or AI general it's the general name for our all our ai services so in the platform we have uh, ai services one is what i showed you today and it's it's using uh, the large language models if we talk about some other parts of our ai technology they use other things but it, it is helix gpt is what is in the platform so what i say is uh, digital workplace powered by Helix GPT, meaning that we use this large language model technology uh, to answer questions. If we talk about the chatbot, it's, it has been, it, we call it virtual agent nowadays, but it, it, it's the chatbot. It has been using Watson only, IBM Watson only as the AI engine, but uh, we have now also support for Helix GPT. So you can have the Helix virtual agent powered by Watson, or you can have Helix virtual agent powered by Helix GPT. And the big difference, if you do that, is uh, the, that before you kind of had to train Watson on the intents you had, you took it a uh, kind of topic that you wanted it to understand, and then you had to train it on how can we say the same thing. You saw I asked about holiday, I asked about vacation, uh, and I used different words, uh, and that would require some training on Watson. Here, the large language model has already been trained on understanding all those words, so you don't really know need to do that if you use Helix GPT instead. And uh, the other part is the dialogue is uh, also built uh, automatically by the large language model. In Watson, you, you kind of have to be a programmer to, to define what happens if I ask uh, a kind of side the question. How do I manage that uh, jump out of the current and how can I jump back? How do I remember what the topic is about and so on? So I, that is the answer. It's not... It's not different. It's the virtual agent powered by Watson or virtual agent powered by Helix GPT. Uh, so does that answer your question? It was from Anonymous, but I'm sure they'll reply back. Kaf, I've tried to summarize what you've just said, so I'll get you to check it later, my homework okay, and my spelling. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, we'll get through these uh, final few, and I know, Philippe and Simon, you've got your hands coming up. I will reach out to you very shortly. So next question was, Helix GPT, does it learn from customer data or on generally available public data? Oh, I, I hope you saw that it is based on the knowledge articles in our knowledge base. It uses the large language model language knowledge. I mean, to understand, well, if I type vacation, if I misspell, there was a question about misspelling. I didn't show the misspelling capabilities because I wanted it to be sure it understood what I was typing. Uh, but it can understand if I mistype. Uh, and that is what we use it for, to, 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 to create a dialogue with the user and understand what the user is doing. But we... It's it's called retrieval augmented generation. So we augment the knowledge in the the large language model with the customer specific knowledge in the knowledge base. And currently we have focused on the knowledge basis because you manage the quality of the data in there, and that means you get better answers. So uh, uh, I hope that answers your questions. Kaf, I'll get you to summarize that, but I've put a couple of notes in. Um, if there's anything further, I know someone's not put their name down. If you want to come back and let us know, that would be great. Um, next question, how long does it take to schedule an upgrade? We have been waiting for a few months now for the CSM response team to schedule a patch to resolve an issue for us. The upgrade process seems very difficult and slow today. I don't know if anyone on the team want to take that 
Otherwise, I might be able to answer it partially. I don't know, I Kath, think you're uh, quite close to them and Kapil. I think this uh, needs to be taken up uh, with the respective account team because there's a process for scheduling upgrades. Uh, the account team should be able to help with that. Okay, thank you. And I know when I worked in my premier role, working very closely with the customer success team, what they do is they schedule only a couple of week. If they were doing any more than a couple of week, we need to make sure each customer goes through smoothly. And I know they have a schedule in place um, and it will depend on size, the data center, migrations, the things that people need. But whoever's responded to that, if you're still on the line and you want to have further insight, if you're not getting the response from the CSM team, feel free to reach out to me. I work very closely with them. Okay. Um, Robert, I saw you have a question as well. Um, Robert, if you're still on, um, feel free to come off mute. So you had, what is the lowest version that supports it? Um, and that means in reference to Helix GPT. So Kath, maybe another question for you. 23.3.0 is the absolute minimum. Uh, so that is very clear. Okay, I'm just checking to see if Robert is... Oh, he is GPT. Okay, yeah. because I was first reading, mm -hmm. what is it? <laughs> but now <laughs> I realize why, what it, and how you knew it was it, <laughs> what it means. Uh, Will Helix GPT come with any out of the box report? It would be good to have reports on usage, mm. frequently asked questions, percent of questions closed solely by AI. Yes, um, two answers to that. Uh, because we have a knowledge base in the back end, the knowledge base is uh, pretty good at reporting on gaps in knowledge, how much they are used, if they are flagged, if there are feedback and things like that. So the knowledge bases themselves have a lot of knowledge about uh, who uses it and what is used and what is missing and so on. So that is one of the benefits of using the knowledge bases and why we actually decided to start with the knowledge bases. You have a life cycle, you maintain them and so on. Uh, in patch one, we will also support um, SharePoint and the PDF documents and Word documents on SharePoint. And we'll support uh, Confluence uh, and there are also PDF documents, Word documents and the, the native. Yes. There uh, we don't have that same type of reporting, but in that patch, we will also uh, collect more metrics, uh, which is, for example, what questions were asked and what was the response, uh, how many of them were uh, responded to from a conversation point of view. So there will be some out of the box reports. If you have looked at Helix Virtual Agent today, you can go to our documentation and uh, uh, look at Helix dashboards, which is our reporting engine. It has a number of out-of-the-box reports already for Helix Virtual Agent, and uh, those will be supported in patch one. We are collecting information and uh, sharing that is the plan. Uh, I hope it's it's ready in patch one or patch two. So that's the plan anyhow. Thanks, Kath. I've tried to summarize. It's very hard summarizing your responses because they're I, very, I'm very detailed, which is great Am for I talking customers. Too much? No, no, no. We know you like it and it's really important for customers. Um, so the last question we've got on the Q&A before I get the hand raises and then we must um, close for today, but how to get a demo instance of these applications um, just to try some of these use cases. So that may be a question for our PS team on here or yourself. No, I think it talk to your account team, your account manager and uh, or if, if it is your CS, CSM team, uh, customer services representatives and say that you have a business case that you're interested in uh, Helix GPT and uh, we can work out the way you need to be upgraded to 23.3 on your Helix environment uh, but then it's pretty easy and you need to have one of these large language model subscriptions and then we can work to get this tested out. Wonderful. And Kapil's just responded with the link where they can request the trial. Thank you, Kapil, for that. 
Um, I'm just going to go to the two hand raises and then I'll go back to the last question. It seems like everyone's in free flow now. So, Philip, you've been incredibly patient. Um, do you want to come off of mute? Um, I'll let you ask your question that obviously I've responded back to in the uh, chat. Do you want to speak live? I see Kapil has a question also now on the screen. Hi, Samantha, are you talking to me? Yes, I was. You've been very, oh, okay. very patient, Philip. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <clears throat> well, and so I think Bob, so I've worked heavily with Bob at, at NASA. And again, it's a, you know, a, a governmental agency. I've done some work with the Pentagon and and, and his other uh, government customers. And yeah, so I think, I think you kind of answered my question a little bit. Um, but I recently gave a keynote last month, actually, for the IEEE on AI. You know, the, the topic was AI friend or foe. And yeah, we introduced the the topic of, of closed and open loop large language models. And my question was kind of what Bob talked about um, at the FBI and things. We're, we're trying to make sure that the, uh, you know, because there, there's a great propensity for people to try out chat GPT, right? And from a security perspective, we want to make sure that, you know, you don't ask chat GPT if in addition to these 11 herbs and spices, you know, if you added paprika, would that, you know, augment it? And now you've just taken the 11 herbs and spices for the Kentucky Fried Chicken and put it out in the large language model, right? So my question was, and it was hard to, it was hard to determine, but I think, I think you've answered this. The integration you have with, with Helix GPT is, is a, um, it integrates with the open loop or the, you know, whether it's BARD or whether it's uh, OpenAI's chat GPT. <clears throat> Uh, and I think, I think I'm hoping that you're going to move forward to something that I've seen at um, at eBay, where they've used the API, created their own closed loop large language model, and populated it with, in their particular instance, images of authentic Louis Vuitton bags, you know, so they can detect fakes. So my question, I think, I think you've answered my question about the open loop and closed loop, and and I will encourage you to pursue the ability for us at the government level, whether it's the Pentagon or NASA or Air Force or whatever, to be able to use closed loop large language models. And maybe that's on us. where We've got to download the API, create our own LLMs. Um, so I think that has been answered, but that's definitely something that keeps most of us government on-prem folks from implementing what you've done that goes out to to the, the internet, to the, these large language models can have hallucinations and things. That's, I think that's basically been answered. But as I was waiting it, with it my hand- It would be really cool if- Go ahead. And you provide the APIs to us so we can integrate with it and then we can run a test. That would be very interesting. I missed I missed the first part of your comp of your question, but I don't want to take up a, a, a lot of your time. No, but no, what finished, I said was- it would be very interesting to do what you said. You said uh, we might have to download a model and host it in our own, own data center. And then I think we could ho hook up with that model together with you and see how it works. That, that would be very interesting for us because then we have a solution that could be used uh, for the government in, in the US. Absolutely. Well, and that protects the data from a security perspective. We can reduce hallucinations and so on and so forth. So, yeah, um, I'll put my email address in, in the chat if you'd like. Um, the the last off. question that I had That's when cool. I was looking at the HR component of this, I, I know that when we implemented the HR component at the U.S. House, uh, it, it turns out that what what we had, what we, what we purchased and were using was not um, was not multi-tenant. So we had to add another layer to make it multi-tenant. I'm assuming then that's been resolved in the HR component that you just demonstrated today. Is that correct? I leave that so, to copy to answer, I think. Yeah, multi-tenancy in a given line of business can be supported using multiple companies. But uh, we'd like to hear what your specific use cases. We can take this offline, but generally, uh, multi tenancy can be initiated using multiple companies at a line of business level in case that's what you're looking for. Right. Well, I mean, this was a couple of years ago. Uh, I think this was during the 116th congressional transition. Um, yeah. And we discovered that, you know, we, we'd selected the product and it just, it was not multi-tenant. So we had to add some code. I think you've answered my questions. Samantha, I'll yield back. Thank you so much. I will put you in contact with both the product managers, Philip. Um, I think they're really good points and we have got a lot of government customers. So um, thank you. And hopefully that's been useful. We can carry on that conversation. 
Um, Simon, I see you have your hand up. Do you want to unmute yourself? If you can hear us, okay. Yes, thank you. Yep. Hello. <laughs> you are. Hello. <laughs> What shall that be? Yeah, it should be some, it should be probably that's our mouth. Yes, we can hear you, Simon. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> it just speak to Peter. Um yeah, a couple of basically echoing what Bob and Philip have said, um, we were under the understanding we we go to twenty three three on Friday. Um so Helix GPT is sort of key to our strategy moving forward. Um and we were under the impression too that it was an on-premise so, you know it was all inside our tenants and then it job. was mentioned a few days ago um that it's it, it, you have to go out to the, the third parties um so it sort of follows on from what they were saying so that. um having said that um the, the question i've got really um is you've got answer a lot of them is around the knowledge um and, uh, Every time we see to see something new with knowledge, it usually is followed by oh, it's come around. And I think what I'm sort of wondering, I know it was mentioned that come around with the tax, but does general the use of the knowledge within Helix GPT is that the old conventional knowledge? Does that work? Okay, do we need to do anything special with it, um, or is that good to go? it's a little bit hard to hear because there is some background discussions but i think what you you asked can you use helix gpt with bwf knowledge itism knowledge or only come around and the answer is you can use it with all three right now what we have implemented for come around in addition to just selecting the the public, publicly available knowledge articles is uh, to tag them and you can filter on the tags. That you can't do with the other ones. That is come around only for now, at least. Was that your question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Simon, I'll, I'll send you out. We had the come around webinars last week on the first. I'll send you the recordings because I think some of that from what I can recall, because I was with Emma last week that we've covered that off. And um, if you do need to get in contact with Eric again, I'm happy to provide the details because our product managers want to work very closely with customers. But I, I remember him showcasing some of that in last week's webinar and it's on our YouTube channel. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'll make note to send that out. Okay, um, I think we've got a few. Have we got a few sneaky more questions? Um, no, I think we've got. Oh, actually, one more, Kath, and then we'll um, wrap because we're already four minutes over. So, we are using BWF to implement onboard and offboard use case shown. Can we implement it directly into BWF or HR? SM, is this something extra feature which we would need to buy? So I don't know, Kapil, if you want to take that one as opposed to CAF. Yeah, so uh, I uh, the, the buy part is a different question, but uh, HR, the onboarding and offboarding content, the use cases are shipped with business workflows. It's available as content in your dev environment uh, under a dedicated line of business, and then you have the option of reusing it, right? Uh, whether you can use it or it also depending on what kind of licensing model it is that's why maybe the buy part we can take offline but uh, the hr content is available uh, as part of business workflows you don't have to separately install it uh, it's available as content in the dev environment uh, you need to move it from the business vmc shipped lob to your lob in the dev environment and then you can migrate it to qa prod and start using it Thank you, Kapil. I'm not sure who asked that question. It was anonymous, but um, obviously if they've got any further questions, they can reach out. 